welcome to the business of music. I'm Jan Hall from Folk Roots Radio. And I'm Gary Glass from Quantum Sound Productions. The business of music is a new video and audio podcast devoted to all aspects of the music business. Yes, and remember, you can find us on YouTube. Please subscribe, ring the bell to get notifications. Also, the podcast goes out on SoundCloud, iTunes, and wherever you can find podcasts. So the goal of this show is to use interviews and discussions to really dig into some of the issues that are affecting the industry today. Certainly, there's been huge amounts of change. We also have the opportunity through our guests, though, to to talk about uh, ways that we can help people who are just starting out in the music business. That sounds like a lofty goal, but that's what we're going to try and achieve. Now, today we're joined by Mary Newland and Richard Baker. They make music together as Mary and Richard. They're also involved in the Blue Bayou Band, which is a band that has a passion for the music of the 70s and particularly um, music through the eyes of Linda Ronstadt. They're our guests in the studio. The interesting thing about these people, though, is they spent 30 years in Los Angeles uh, involved in some great records, Richard played with Santana, Gina Vanelli, Gary Wright, Leo Sayer, one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they're perfect people to talk about how the music business yeah. used to be. Mary's no how slouch. It is today. I mean, yeah, Mary's, Mary's no slouch. Same well. with the Beach Boys. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and this is gonna. This show is uh, a little different. Is it's going to be a nostalgia evening and a look back and a look forward. Um, For people who have seen a lot and been through an industry that's changed tremendously and uh, how, you know, how they're approaching it now um, and how maybe they feel the future may turn out for, you know, the singers, songwriters, whatever, composers, everything in the future. Absolutely. It's great to have you guys join us. What we wanted to to do at the start is sort of we're going to jump in our time machine and go back because... You guys spent 30 years in Los Angeles. Now, Mary, you're originally from southwestern Ontario, which is where we're based. Tell us how you ended up in L.A., and I guess we're going to find out how you met Richard. Well, um, it was sort of uh, fortuitous. I had gone with a friend to the Ford Auditorium in Detroit to see a Beach Boys concert. And um, through that evening, I ended up meeting the crew and the management and and all the guys in the band and um, continued on um, (laughs) via the post office. There was no internet in those days and um, kept up uh, with them and um, uh, struck up a friendship and and was invited to go out there. So I just decided one day that that sounded like a really good idea and uh, took my savings, my lifeguard savings, and uh, purchased a, a one-way ticket to Los Angeles. That was 1972. So that's how that um, uh, came to be. And, of course, since I already knew them, uh, the Beach Boys and their organization, it was uh, sort of a natural as I started to, you know, sort of sing along as just a friend. And then someone said, hey, that sounds pretty good to me. So uh, I had some opportunities there, which were really good. And then I uh, infiltrated into the... Um, uh, the the music the musicians uh, community I guess you would call it and uh, started sitting in in clubs and um, that eventually led to my meeting Richard because one of the ex uh, Gino Vanelli fellows ended up in my band and um, it was kind of funny two or three guys from Gino's band ended up in my band and uh, at one point my manager was looking for a producer and he had just exited the Santana uh, organization and uh, I was the first. Uh, artist that he signed to his production company so that's uh that's how we met and when you went out there you started to get work as a vocalist mm-hmm. I mean, you know obviously that yes. that's what you're known for yes. now yeah. you know, have a a fabulous singing voice thank you um and you you got involved in some interesting projects you mentioned you actually recorded with the the beach boys didn't mm-hmm. you at least uh yeah uh once or twice yeah i did some back vocals in the studio with them and and a few uh, performances uh live um, the, I have to say, though, one of the first things I did, and I was extremely fortunate to have uh, people guide me in this, is that I went and I got um, training and was really fortunate to study with one of the top uh, vocal coaches in Los Angeles. 
And I think of this person, of Seth and Florence Riggs, every single time I sing. Their technique and what they taught me has been invaluable. And I actually feel like I'm singing better today than maybe I ever have. It's just it's been an ongoing process. And, you know, you keep sort of, um, you know, uh, shining your 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 abilities uh, and working your chops. And so that's that was, I think, a big uh, a big thing was the was training. I also took a piano uh, study and um, I went to the Dick Grove School of Music for um, sight singing because there was a huge market for jingle recording for advertisements. So that was also very valuable. So you did quite a bit of that as well. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess it must be kind of like being an actor in L.A. You know, as you say, that everybody who's waiting table in L.A. is, is an aspiring actor. <laughs> Got discovered. Yeah. It's waiting true. Tables. It's yeah. true. In, in our case, you know, in those days, we were extremely fortunate. There were gigs. There were tons of gigs. You just went from one gig, one club to the next and and would be there for months, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so you would have this ongoing income. So it allowed you to be able to go and, you know, get into jam sessions and um, work groups and vocal lessons and, you know, anything like that that helped you not only uh, improve yourself, but to network and meet other musicians. And that was extremely valuable, especially when you go into the studio. You had guys you could call that were, you know, top flight. So that was um, a big plus gigs they don't exist that way anymore no it's well, a completely different here. world yeah. <laughs> not too many places i don't think yeah. no so tell us your story i know i know i should <laughs> hand it over to gary because he's <laughs> no no i was i was going to interject a little like locally there's a legend about mary in this okay. area <laughs> about how she went to california to seek her fortune mm-hmm. but we won't yeah. discuss that too much but it's it's a it's a lovely legend, to yeah. be honest. I, I vaporized. Yeah. I was just gone one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Richard, you've played yeah. with Santana, yes. Gina Vanelli, yes. mentioned Leo Sayer. Yep. Um, tell us a little bit about how you ended up in L.A. Where are you actually from originally? Uh, I was born and grew up in Montreal. <clears throat> and um, after many years of uh, working there, I went to McGill, uh, did a lot of club work, a lot of studio work, uh, worked for the CBC at the time. Um, I ran into a fellow by the name of Gino Vanelli, and, and uh, the opportunity arose for me to audition, which I did. Uh, got the gig, and uh, they were uh, just getting ready to go to California and do uh, which was actually their second album. Uh, very few people know Gino's first album was called Crazy Life and uh, he did it just he and his brother by themselves uh, with Herb Albert producing and uh, I still think it's contains some of the best songs he's ever written Um, but uh, the first record I did was Powerful People and so uh, right around the end of 1970 uh, we went down to Los Angeles and uh, uh, A&M Studios which was very exciting at the time and uh, started recording. And uh, that was how I got there. Gino's band mm-hmm. was no guitars, right? The, yes. And at the time, that this was very, very revolutionary. revolutionary. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, the whole synth thing was just really in, yeah. its, in its infancy. And, um, you know, some of the, I remember some of the instruments that we had. Yeah, were, you, had like, you had opportunity at the, way back in those days for... Uh, Companies coming out with synthesizers and things. Yes. Yeah, you know, like it's like here, try this. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, oh, what do you think for about sure. This, you know, how many, you know, but how many voices did some of them have? Like, uh, two, well, when we or? when we started, they only had one. Yeah. There was no, there were no polyphonic synthesizers at that time. The all the the original Moogs were all monophonic. Yeah. Uh, the original um, uh, Korg instruments mm-hmm. were all monophonic, and it was about. Uh, two or three years in where polyphony started to happen, you know, the instruments started to become a little more sophisticated. You could actually play two notes at one time instead of just one. (laughs) So, you know, what we had to do was uh, split. If we wanted to get like a full chord, um, we had to kind of split the parts between, you know, the uh, the keyboardists. Uh, there was so myself. There was Gino's brother was also a keyboard. Player, yes, he right? was. Joe Vanelli, excellent, excellent musician, great keyboard player, and uh, we also had a fellow uh, that Mary knows very well, um, a fellow by the name of Johnny Mandel, 
who um, uh, was also from Montreal. We kind of knew each other there, and he ended up in the band with me. And uh, he played percussion and keyboard. Um, and then, of course, we had uh, we had a drummer. We had Graham Lear on drums, who was uh, marvelous. And so it was a very, very uh, unique and interesting uh, challenge at that moment in time because, you know, what you were hearing in your head, you just couldn't. You know, nowadays you can just sit down and bang, you know, there it is, right? But those days it was one note at a time. And when we recorded albums, in order to get full string parts, we had to do pass after pass after pass mm -hmm. after pass and then yeah. bounce it down yeah, and then track. Uh, yeah, and just track. track like crazy for weeks. <laughs> now, you did us the large favor of bringing in a gold <laughs> album and we'll, yes. we'll flash it on the screen for people. Sure. But Gino, mm -hmm. uh, now which album is that? Uh, that would be uh, the uh, that one, Storm at Sun Up. I think it's the one that we that we brought. Yeah, I think that's if what I'm it says. Yeah, on so it. yeah, it's Storm at Sun Up. Storm, yeah. yeah, that one was uh, that was done in, in Los Angeles. That was the second one that uh, that we did. Uh, the first one was called Power for People, sure, yeah, the, which yeah, which and, did quite well. And surprisingly enough, uh, when I mentioned Gino Vanelli, and it's like to people. Especially younger people, they go, oh, oh, I know. Who the heck is that? It's yeah. Like, <laughs> and it's like, how can he be from Montreal? He has an Italian name. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Montreal, as you yeah, may know, has a very, crazy. very large Italian uh, yeah. Italian population. Yeah. Always has had. I mean, half of my friends were Italian when mm -hmm. I was growing up. So, um, yeah, uh, it was uh, it was a very, very interesting, uh, interesting band. And uh, to this day, I think one of the for for me one of the best bands I ever played with. The challenges were through the roof and um, I was also the bass player in that band we didn't have obviously sure, a string bass and so yeah so I was playing left hand bass and then sure. organ and, and whatever like with, a John Paul Jones thing uh, pretty much yes well, exactly mm -hmm. and then at some point maybe not with Gino but maybe at some other point you did you ever end up playing the Taurus pedals uh uh, I didn't. I played the keyboard version of the Taurus pedals, oh, okay. but uh, I no, I was never pedals. all that great I mean, with my feet. <laughs> Keith Emerson, I mean, made him famous. Oh, um, yes. No, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Keith is a monster. Yeah. And you had some interaction with Keith. He was in a studio very next to you or close by. Um, I did. Uh, many, this is quite a few years uh, down the road, but um, Keith, um, uh, they were coming into the studio um, to... Um, to do a record with Keith Olsen. And what they wanted to do was... Uh, God, I'm trying to remember the name of the album now. It was Return of the Manticore. Return of the Manticore. And it, when they... Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, should, I'm glad I brought my memory with me yeah. here. <laughs> um, yes, and, and uh, the original album that they had released uh, was a live record. And they'd always had a desire to do that record, but in the studio under controlled mm -hmm. conditions, sure. you know. And so that's what was supposed to happen here. And uh, unfortunately, Keith um, ended up with um, a carpal, tunnel. Carpal, carpal. carpal tunnel in mm -hmm. his wrist and had to go in for surgery. It was really, really bad, and he couldn't really uh, do very much. And so I ended up doing all the keyboard stuff that mm. he would have done. <laughs> and uh, a lot of it was, you know, programmed and, and uh, performed live as well. So mm. uh, it was, that was a real thrill for me because I was a big fan. Sure. <laughs> so yeah, of course. Was, yeah, so, lots of fun. So, okay, now going back a little bit. So after yeah. Gino, you did some, you, you were just kind of like a session musician for a while? Um, I was, uh, you know, I should probably mention, for me at least, uh, one of the most interesting experiences that I had with Gino was uh, we spent a year in England and uh, did an album called Just of the Gemini. And uh, I got to record at Air Studios in London, and Jeff Emmerich was the co-producer on that oh, album. Great producer. Mm -hmm. My God. Yeah. <laughs> And I got My to hang with George. Well. Yeah, no, I got no to hang with George conscience. Martin, and you know all that wow. stuff. But yeah, so it was that was a lot of fun uh, for me. And uh, uh, we we actually rehearsed for about six months uh, out in Surrey, at a place called Ridge Farm, which is a 14th century, really old farmhouse, still active to this day. Yeah, and a lot of good albums were produced there. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, and and a lot of the, it, they what they did is they took the barn and converted it into yeah. a rehearsal facility, but they still had. You know, sheep and cows and all kinds of other stuff going on. Yeah. And we all had a little shepherd's cottage to stay in. It was just absolutely wonderful. I loved it. And uh, and so we got a good six months of rehearsal in, and then we moved into London for six months and did the album there. So it was, uh, yeah, a lot of fun. And what were you doing at the time? Just 
during this during, period? Were you you two were together then? Right? No. no. Oh no, 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 no. no we oh, didn't yeah, meet until is... he left Santana. So oh, yeah. at so this point, was... I would have still been um, uh, with the, uh, the with the Beach Boys, and I think during that period of time it was probably the Beach Boys Chicago tour, I believe, oh, yeah. that I was on, which was really interesting. And Chicago. traveling with that band was a lot of fun. You know, you had a double bill like that at a well, you Chicago. know big stadium. <laughs> so it, was, it was quite quite something. So certainly some of the some of the best music. Yeah, I, like I don't want to call it. I wouldn't really classify it as rock, but you know, it it was, certainly was a an early entry into the rock. Oh like, yes, twenty five or six to four. I mean, oh, oh yeah, it's oh, just yeah. like no, the no, best no. song ever written. And That's the, the great, horn charts great tune, yes. and those. You know, <laughs> Jimmy Panko wrote the horn charts for that band, yeah. and it was. Uh, it was kind of interesting because it was similar to the combination of the Latin plus rock in Santana. So mm. Chicago yeah, was, was sort yeah. of the introduction of sort of the jazz big band feel yeah. into a rock a scenario. Bit out of the box, but, yeah. but yeah. really it captured something special. It, oh, it certainly did. Created a, a whole new genre of mm-hmm. its own. Yes, you know? it, it certainly Tower did. of Power was subsequent yeah. to yeah. that, yeah. you know? Yeah, so. that's right. Yeah. So then, so after being a session independent musician you joined santana actually a couple of things happened in the interim um when uh when i left uh, gino um i ended up going with gary wright oh, okay. and uh we did the uh, dreamweaver tour and uh, then i co-produced an album with him after that called touch and gone mm-hmm. um and uh so i was probably involved with that for a couple of years and then I sort of decided to stay stay in one place for a while, and right. uh, and uh, you know, fortunately, had a little bit of a reputation amongst some of the musicians and producers in LA, and so I was able to start getting some session work and studio work and stuff, which was uh, very very interesting and a lot of a lot of fun actually, because mm-hmm. I got a lot to do a lot well, of different kinds yeah, of music. Yeah, you're not doing you know, the same thing every day. No, do you, you remember the Buck Rogers show? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, he, he did I was the in the orchestra for that. Really? Yeah, yeah you know, oh, back then all those shows. Uh, Wonder Woman. I did all uh, Wonder Woman shows. They had mm. sixty-five piece orchestra, you mm. know, and it was live. Man, you go in there, and one day the whole show was done. It was so uh, it was a different show up on the screen, and you guys would be yeah. They projected, and we'd have a conductor, and you just follow the conductor, and and you know, read your part. And so I, you I, go. I guess in those days it was a combination of obviously having the chops to to do what was needed, but yes, to making sure that you were ready, willing, and able. Whenever they called, I don't even know how much notice they gave. Yes, and and you know, uh, L.A. especially in those days, I, I suppose to this uh, this day as well, uh, is a very competitive market for yeah. for a musician, as you can imagine. And so you wanted to make sure you were available if you wanted to continue working because there were a thousand guys right behind you, right. just as good who yeah. were ready to operate in right. And so you kind of once you got there, you kind of had to protect your territory a little bit. Um, and to a certain there degree. wasn't really a lot of notice. You'd get a call, yeah, whether it was, was for thinking, vocalist yeah. or, oh, or player. Oh, oh God, it could yeah. be the next day, you know. Yeah. And, and you just you just go there, and you have to read it down. If you don't, you won't get called again. That's all there is to it, you know. Epitome of a, a good musician. Well, the skill set back then was. Uh, the, the demand was very high. Mm-hmm. You know, you had to you had to be able to sight read obviously very well uh, because there was no time. It was a three hour session or whatever it was. It got done in that three hours. And usually, especially with the TV shows and stuff, it was one run through and a take mm-hmm. done. And so there were no mistakes. No. And if there were, you didn't get called again. So. Yeah, because there's a budget <laughs> you know? and those studios are extremely expensive, especially oh the scoring stages. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So how did the the Santana thing start then? Um, well, uh, again, well, was there I, I, something else? There was one. That? There was one before <laughs> there, and that, that was the Leo Sarah. And you, you, you oh, mentioned okay. <clears throat> now. Uh, I unfortunately didn't get a chance to record with Leo, but right. uh, I did do the longest tour of my life and of his life as well. We did a fourteen month world tour, and uh, which was really really exciting because I got to go places I never thought I'd get to go. And um, it was a challenge for me because, as you know, Leo's reputation in the U.S. is a little bit different than his mm. reputation in England. Uh, he's a song and dance man, and, and that's kind of the genre that he comes from. When he came to the United States, he became known as an R&B artist. 
But um, on this tour, of course, we did you know the big hits that he had and and uh, uh, during every show. But the rest of the show was really more back to his roots. It was British Music Hall, and a lot of it was just piano. Which is piano funny because that was you know? the first songs I got ever exposed to. You know, like oh, wow. long told glasses. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, oh sure. Yeah. The question would the... be, did you feel like dancing? Oh, <laughs> Richard I'm not doesn't much, dance. I'm not much of a dancer, I'm afraid. It's like <laughs> but, that Ronald Reagan foot, right? <laughs> but I don't, da- I don't yeah. dance. Don't ask. Me, That's you know? right. Well, you know, the the interesting thing was it was. I mean, it really showed that breakthrough because when mm-hmm. he broke through and became really popular, and then, you know, mm-hmm. the music hall kind of dropped away a little bit. Yes, you it know, did. This, you know, he would, you know, some of his, uh, the original film rather than video would be, you know, mm-hmm. him miming and, you know, and, and singing and, you know, what have you. Because he, he was a song and dance man. Oh, he was. And yeah. he was really, really good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was a challenge for me because, or anybody that worked with him, but particularly if you're playing piano, because a lot of the show is just piano vocal and it would change every night. Depending on the feedback he was getting from the audience would depend on, okay, well, if I move my hand this way and I look at you this way, that means you're going to do this next. But if I do this, then you're going to do that. And so it was – you had to just keep your eye glued to him for, you know, the entire entire time, which was a challenge, but it was fun. I always have enjoyed a challenge. And I I guess from the point of view of yourself, you know, Mm -hmm. when you you haven't been in the studio, you haven't worked on – the albums, mm-hmm. but then suddenly being picked up to to play on a tour and, yes. and something like this, yeah, that must be huge and undertaking to you know from your point of view to to actually get out there and get completely up to speed and adjust to the artist yes. because you know as we know all artists can have their own oh rhythm indeed. and their own <laughs> ideas on everything. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, uh, it, it was it was a big challenge. Um, but, you know, I had uh, done a lot of that kind of work, uh, even in the Vanelli stuff. I mean, you know, we used to do a two-hour show, and everything was memorized. I mean, we didn't read anything on stage. Um, and, uh, you know, same in Santana, same thing with Lear, Leo. Everything was in your head. It had to be memorized. And so that was really the challenge was learning the songs, learning how the artist presents the songs, and then just remembering your parts. And, uh, you know, some things you had the leeway to kind of change on the spot and sort of do what you felt but then other things were carved in stone and those had to be done exactly the same way every night so um, it's very interesting it's a lot of fun okay so let's yeah, you oh, I know, I know. You want to get the same thing. I do. And and that's, we have to keep it moving. That's next. Yes, yes, yes. And so, that's of next course. in the so, chronology. Um, yeah. I got a little photo here. Just oh, for everybody. <laughs> and you know, put this on the screen. But okay. So this is from the Z Bop album. Yes. And this would have been nineteen uh Z Bop. Oh was it 80 70, yeah, 79, 80. Right in, there. right yeah, in that it's area. About right. now, yeah. Richard, for some reason, is hiding in the back. <laughs> so we had to. He's right <laughs> oh, next there to you Carlos. Go. <laughs> with a lot more hair. With, with a, a lot more color. hair, yes, hair. absolutely. <laughs> Those were the days. But, yeah, so obviously you, you were in the band. You toured, mm-hmm. what, two albums with him? Uh, yes, we toured two albums. Uh, I was in a band from the uh, very end of 1979 uh, until the beginning of 1984. Is, uh, is when I exited. So uh, we did quite a few tours, actually, and uh, and two albums. And so I saw a... Santana <laughs> at Pine Knob, okay. now known as DTE Energy, on the Shango tour. So oh, I nice. saw you. There. You did. You would have seen. You would have seen me there. Actually, we played Pine Knob quite a few times. Yeah. And yeah. and I I really enjoy that it's venue. A great venue. It's a wonderful venue to play at. It really is. It's a it's a lot of fun. Last time I was there, I saw Slipknot. So. Oh, <laughs> so, so did you play worldwide with them? I mean, yes. Oh, yes. Because uh, I saw Santana Nebworth. Nebworth, whatever, he would have yeah. been there. Yeah. Uh, I, you would have seen me at Nebworth because that's <gasps> I did I did that gig. There you are. You see, I've seen him play at Nebworth. <laughs> Do you remember which tour it was? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, unfortunately, I didn't go to Nebworth specifically to see Santana. It's uh, we did have a Shame a pre discussion <laughs> about the fact that I was kind of you know it, I, when I was. I'm showing my age. When I was at school and, you know, I was 
very into the Abraxas era of oh, Santana. Yes. And yes. Then, of course. You know, by then I got, I was in Genesis and then Peter Gabriel, who oh, was yes. really who I went to. Oh, absolutely. I think it, Santana was on yeah, the same bill as I, I believe so. I went so. to them I don't with remember. twice that year, so oh, yeah, I, I get don't. confused as to which one's which. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Yeah. I can't remember the lineup on that particular yeah. gig. But uh, one thing I do remember very well was the house. And they gave us a tour of Nebworth House, which right. was absolutely spectacular. I, I still have the picture of the inside yeah. of that house in my head. It's a yeah. beautiful, beautiful place. Well, you know, the funny thing, we were starting the show and Gary said, we don't want comments from people. There's probably people who are watching this saying, okay, that Jen wasn't exactly right when she said that. But, <laughs> uh, but, but no, memory is memory. You know, <laughs> it is. And the older you get, the funnier it gets. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So um, what was it like? Being in a a band like Santana, I mean, with so many talented players, and um, you know, it was great. touring night after night. It was great. Uh, I mean, you know, touring is uh, a lot of work. It yeah. is. It's a, it's a very very very. I mean, you know, there's the glamorous aspect of it and what you see from the audience, but what goes on in the background on a daily basis is uh, can sometimes be very grueling. Right. Um, and um, but when you're on stage, it makes it all worth it. Because, you know, I mean, some shows obviously go better than others. And, you know, you remember the ones that went uh, really, really, really well. But um, it, just playing the quality of musicianship was extraordinary. And uh, for me, it was very, very interesting because uh, the drummer in the, gram in the band was Graham Lear, who was also the, gr the drummer in Gene Vanelli. And so we'd been friends for many, many, many years. And in my humble opinion, to this day, one of the best drummers on the planet. I mean, this guy... Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's just, I can't say enough about Graham. So having him holding things down and then, uh, you know, the percussionist Armando Peraza was just the most extraordinary man. He's the fellow on the very end there on the left. Um, he was originally from Cuba and uh, had played this guy when I was in the band. I think he was already in his late 60s. Um, but he played with every jazz great mm -hmm. like through the 20s and 30s and 40s and toured mm -hmm. you know everywhere I mean he's just an incredible incredible musician and one of the nicest part of that um, the Cuban invasion with all yes. of those mm -hmm. artists that came from Cuba into, into the United States along with Desi Arnaz and uh, Xavier mm -hmm. Cugat and these, yes. all these marvelous musicians Harry Belafonte did a wonderful documentary mm. and we were watching it and we went oh my gosh look there's Armando <laughs> yeah. and, mm -hmm. but he is that uh, well revered that uh, he ended up in this in this documentary so oh. he was just um, strong oh my gosh this man was strong yeah he's probably Great walked 10-15 miles a day no matter where we were uh, right after sound check Armando would be out just walking down the highway. Mm. No, no, I'll walk to the hotel. I don't need a ride. And you're just out there again. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's great. Walk. Great. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, no, wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, all the players. I mean, I can't say enough about uh, about everybody in the band. I was very, very fortunate yeah. to be in that lineup. I think. Yeah. So after Santana, mm -hmm. you was that when you started to get more into composing for for film and everything? And I guess. You met Mary. Yes. Uh, I met Mary. And, and the uh, first thing that we did, aside from my record, was the score for, um, we did uh, 13 episodes of a television show. That's right. Uh, yes. Called Mad Movies with the L.A. Connection, which was quite hilarious, where they edited uh, public domain movies down into a half-hour format and removed all of the dialogue and sound effects and everything and put hilarious dialogue into the mouths of the actors and uh, we we uh, we wrote and I performed the theme yep. as well as we scored all of the uh, provided all the music for the episodes so that was a lot of I fun. I don't think I've ever laughed more in my oh life. Oh my gosh. It's kind of like science fiction theater or something. You know? Mystery, yeah. yeah. Uh, mystery, mystery Very theater. similar, theater. 2000, similar, similar idea. Yeah, similar very idea. Very similar idea. And what's up, Tiger but, Lily, the Woody Allen. But yes. see, these people were, um, they were really fastidious. They made sure that the dialogue that they created actually was in sync to the movement the, of the yeah, lips. Yeah, the lip sync was on. So, yeah. it, it, you know, there were times when it really felt like that's what they were saying. So, but that's what we did before. Then he started really getting into the uh, scoring for film after shortly after that. But that I would say that's the genesis of that, from being in a band to yes. film scoring. The first stop was, yes, was the absolutely. TV series. Yeah, 
I have to say I enjoyed uh, – I, I still enjoy it uh, tremendously. It's a completely different – you know, writing for picture is is a completely different world. It's it's not like writing a song. It's although it's, a lot of songs end up sure. in movies, and that's and that's fine. But it's, the actual background score is you know it's a different creative. It is. It's process. a very different creative yeah. process, and the the satisfaction is different. You know, I mean, you get one kind of satisfaction on stage, and you got all kinds of people clapping stuff, which is wonderful. This is a little bit more solitary. But when you when you create something uh, to picture, and it actually works, and it Right. And, yeah. uh, you I, know, I, there's a there's a feeling you're like, I yeah, I did it. You know, that. like I kind of do the reverse. I find music and then I do the video to the music. Sure. And yeah. And yeah, there's a real satisfaction. It's like, hey, this really works. Mm -hmm. together. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, I mean, you know, it's it's a, um, a, a different world. You know, it's the first time that I had to deal with, you know, directors and producers and, and you know, the whole film process mm -hmm. and and uh, um, very often uh, you know people had a preconceived idea of what they wanted uh, in a film and so sometimes you get into rather heated discussions about well I don't agree and well what do you mean you don't agree you're just the composer I'm the director and, and or, so you get in the you or know, they just had a difficult time articulating how exactly. to they wanted, get they wanted, yeah. what they wanted yeah. to achieve musically yeah. for their film right you know, so. and you know you want to satisfy them obviously you want to give them what they want, which is why they're paying you, but on the other hand, your own creative soul is involved in the process, and so you don't want to betray that either, and so there's kind of a fine line, you know, in between, in between those two things, but uh, anyway, yes, a lot, of, a lot of fun, and I was very fortunate to be able to get involved in that. So you continued with that until, well, even after you moved back to Canada, because I think you moved back to Canada in 2006? 2006, 2006 yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And then yep. continued with your yes, I did film and on. TV score. Yeah. Yes, did yeah. several mm -hmm. several films and uh, mm -hmm. some TV work and some commercial work as well. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Now, to bring things up to the present, you're now mm -hmm. Mary and Richard. Um, you know, you put on shows based around what I would like to call the um, Great American Songbook and, and more. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And then the Blue Bayou Band That's kind right. of did it develop out of that the the desire to 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 really do something with the the music of the seventies and you know particularly songs that Linda Ronstadt had I think had made famous. Well, I I don't know if it developed out of that. I think it's something that I've sort of had in the back of my mind for quite a while. And the years that I was uh, gigging in Los Angeles, of course, it was during you know her heyday, the period of time when. The Eagles and Linda Ronstadt and Jackson Brown and all those great acts of that era. This was the material that we sort of drew upon in, you know, the club life that we were performing within. And uh, so I'd always, um, I was always drawn to the way she performed these tunes because we sort of, I think we have a similar sort of, um, how do you want to put it, um, the, the, the way we attack a song. It's probably a little aggressive sounding, but the bottom line is, is that we do um, I have a certain sort of um, um, power. You know, there's a there's the, uh, I related to the way she sang. I think that's probably the, the easiest way to put it. So I thought, gee, you know, it would be really fun to do a collection, you know, pick out all the, the ones the songs that were the most famous or the ones that I liked the most. And I honestly really didn't even realize that there was this massive tribute market going mm. on out there. I didn't mm. even really know about it's it. It's tremendous these tre days. It's oh, huge. Yeah. So it was just sort of born out of, gee, this would be fun. Let's do that, you know. And um, we've been really well received and, um, you know, starting to book again for the summer season. So we've got some dates coming up for that. But, um, uh, yeah, it was, um, I think, Something that was, like I said, is something I wanted to do for some time. So it's it's nice to be able to do it. And particularly with, you know, an artist like Linda, who unfortunately isn't able to perform anymore because yes. of her Parkinson's disease. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. And I, I'd rather, you know, boy, I sure wish she was still performing because I would certainly love to still enjoy that. But uh, for me, it is, you know, I am, in fact, paying tribute to her because she no longer can, whereas a lot of the other bands are touring at the same time the <laughs> real band is touring, and that seems kind of a little odd to me, but, you know, it doesn't matter. People, they, they, 
it's an accessible concert because the ticket prices are much lower. You know, not everybody can afford to fork out 250 bucks to go and see, you know, their favorite artist. Whatever your favorite artist is, yeah. but they can access these uh, tribute bands for far less. And if people want to get information on the Blue Bayou Band, you can go to bluebayouband.com. Yes, correct. absolutely. That's correct. Yeah. 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 And they'll travel anywhere for you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Not quite, but, you know, they well, love almost. to. They love to. <laughs> so I have to say, I, I loved going down memory lane. That was just so much fun. And, you know, we could have continued to talk forever about the way things were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, um, about, what about the industry? Yeah. Uh, yesterday, obviously, very different than today. Yes. So looking at today's music industry, I mean, you guys have a little bit different approach because um, the, most of the people so far on the show, they are, they are actually making you know their own music and they're selling it. They're, they're doing mm -hmm. some of the streaming. They're yeah. more of a performance yes. group. Yes, uh, and that's really a very different animal. Uh, it is, um, you know the the whole singer songwriter thing, as you mentioned. <clears throat> excuse me, is is bigger than ever. I mean, you know, um, it's so it's so much more accessible because well, you can is. record in your basement. Mm -hmm. You can produce your own CDs. Ex or exact, exactly, exactly, right. and and you know that is one. You just hit one of the nails on the head in terms of how things have changed from then till now, and that is. Back in 1970, you nobody was making records in their basement. It was no, physically impossible. Not. You had to go to a studio with a lot of expensive gear and engineers oh. and producers, et cetera, et cetera, and the et cetera. Only place you accessed it was radio, like or in person. Well, that's you exactly know. right. And and so the now you're talking about the business model, which has changed dramatically and mm -hmm. and radically. And I hope it continues to change and uh, returns to a place where it's a little bit more friendly friendly to the artist. Yeah, um, which was radio, know, yeah. radio play, radio. Made you know, artists. Yeah, I mean, made. a lot of people have and still have negative opinions about record companies and what they did and what they took and this and that and the other thing. All of that really um, is irrelevant because at that time period, you wrote a song. If it did get any airplay every time it played, you got paid. Mm -hmm. And you got paid for every time it got paid. And radio stations have to file a log, as I'm yeah. sure you know, about you know what music they're using, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's pretty much gone by the wayside. And, and unfortunately... Um, keeping track of the streaming thing is a very, very difficult uh, task. Well, it's such and, a small amount of money you get for each person. Well, exactly. And, and you know, so I, I personally believe that the copyright laws need to be amended to accommodate, um, you know, a similar situation in um, the new form of broadcast as what we had, you know, in, in, uh, back in the day. Um, again, to give artists a chance to actually be able to make make a few bucks. I think the model you know. really only exists anymore um, in the form of country radio. I can't yes. think of another yeah, genre that's of music. That's very true. Because, that, you know, country music, uh, country radio is still huge. It is. And, yeah. and it is. Probably it, the biggest it, genre for yeah, radio. It exposes their artists very that, well that the way talk. it used to, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah for yeah. sure. I would have to agree. And and today, performance is it's even more important than it used to be. You know, people performance is really where a lot of artists are making their money now that's right but, but still i mean i i hear from you know and obviously i'm in the more in the folk roots area than anything else sure. but i hear from a yes. lot of people mm -hmm. that's saying that it's it's harder and harder to to get good gigs or to actually make a living when you're out there i mean you know because there is so many more ways for people to entertain themselves, you know, with all of the technology. It's true. Um, mm -hmm. This show goes out on YouTube. It goes out on SoundCloud. Uh, people could stay home and, and watch us instead of going to see you play. Or they could, um, you know, it could be playing video games. I mean, even, you know, if we just look at the way that things have shifted in television, I mean, absolutely, you know, more and yeah. more of us choose not to actually have a cable connection relevant. or anything. Yeah, it's true. HBO, Netflix. I mean, Netflix making their own things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's a big yeah. paradigm shift yeah. in well, the, the entertainment. Been yeah. huge. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it has. I think so. And, and so, you know, I have no doubt that eventually it will settle into something that works well for everybody. Um, you know, what uh, my my um, feelings about the industry in general particularly about music. I mean, I, I would say this probably holds true for all artists 
of any kind, whatever art you're pursuing, but music in particular. Um, someone asked Mary the other day at, um, at one of our engagements um, what my real job was. What does Richard really do? Oh, wow. And she What's said, and job? she said, well, he's a musician. They went, what? I mean, you know, and this is something that, you know, this is my own personal, you know, before I go, I want to try and, and make and, and at least present some alternatives. To oh, I that. thought you were going to say you wanted to get a real job. Yeah, yeah well, there you go. Well, <laughs> um, no, but it's it's yeah. it's just that um, you know the where where we ha we are from a f societal standpoint uh, in terms of recognizing the value of music and yeah. that um, musicians should be paid. It's it it's you have to work very hard. You have mm -hmm. to study. You have to practice. You have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to have the you know the wherewithal to get on a stage in front of people and 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 do something this is so where i think you hit the conversation has to go back to education because if music were a real subject an actual subject mm -hmm. like english and math in were schools, in school yes you would have i think a broader respect and knowledge about you know what it takes to be a good musician and so many you know this yeah, yeah. singing well, again, along with karaoke is not being a musician no, you know I, I, yeah we won't go there. <laughs> no. I know but the, you know my what I... Local, the school, the high school I went to, mm -hmm. local school, uh, they had a, and still have, a very good music program. Good. Excellent. And uh, I learned a lot. I unfortunately played an instrument that just haunts me to today. I played the French horn. Wow. Ooh. And it's such a difficult instrument to play, which they didn't tell me that. Oh. Because it has that little tiny mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. That's that's right. That's I love French horn. horn. It's yeah. one of my favorite but instruments. My son, he went through, and my daughter too, and uh, my son played trombone, and he's, excellent. he also plays guitar. And, that's excellent. And even though he doesn't try to make any money from mm -hmm. it, he's, he's a very musical person. That's excellent. And that's, Sh that's you know... And there's something to be said about that, too, because he routinely shows me interesting things on the Internet. That's and, wonderful. And they say that people who are uh, more musically inclined are generally more empathetic, too. Mm -hmm. They're more empathetic. Yeah, They're it's... also better at math. They're, the the it's, circuits it's, in the brain are, well, are Both the hemispheres same, fire you know, when you do music. It's it, the only uh, discipline yeah. that does that's that. That's why I'm so bad. Uh, no, you know, what? someone asked me this question just, I think it was just yesterday, and I said, you know, the bottom line is it doesn't matter if you're going to be a professional. It doesn't matter if you can hold a tune. Even if music courses, even if just one of the, the classes was music appreciation and you just listened and spoke about what you just heard, this would raise, I think, the prestige of those who are looking to make it. Um, a profession, and you would have, I think, a more uh, general respect for it if it were included in a curriculum. We had a, a music course in in my school, and uh, one of part of the course was just music appreciation. The teacher would come in, and you know, this is going back a ways. There was a turntable with vinyl records, yeah, yeah. and and play. But you know, one week it would be classical. Next week it would be. You know, marches. Mm -hmm. Next week it would be rock and roll. Next week it would be jazz or whatever. And so, you know, of course, half the class is you know making spitballs and throwing them around the room, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it went into their ears. Yeah, it it went into their brain, and it did. And it gave them later on in life an appreciation for all these different genres of music. And when you don't teach kids that, you know, what they're subjected to is whatever the flavor of the week is, and that's it. And so, you know, you're really severely limiting the future, I think, by doing that. Anyway. Well, that's a very important point, though, I think, that, you know, when you you look at it. And, I, and again, going back to the fact that, you know, we're all bombarded with, you know, technology. Oh, my I God, mean, yeah. Everything has changed. Social media has influenced everything. You know, we obviously lots of concerns now about the influence that the internet and particularly social media has had on democracy generally oh mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yes oh across, gosh yeah across that's the world. <laughs> um i have to be honest though sitting here and and you know listening to you talk about the fact that you know things may start to swing back i mean mm -hmm. i i actually also believe that i i i don't really do streaming i um i don't have time to stream i have more than enough music um you know, to review Excellent. and decide if I want to put it on the radio or not. Sure. My biggest challenge actually is 
the fact I get so much that actually I kind of wish that there was a better way of filtering. I mean, I struggle yeah. with the filter uh, because of course. Yeah. the fact that, you know, everybody can, you know, record in their basement or, you know, I talked to someone a few weeks ago and said, oh, I record in the bathroom because yep. apparently the acoustics were good, great. Good there. echo, yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's great, but it's, it's, you know, there is that temptation mm -hmm. to get things out there because, again, through social media, it has become easy to stick things out really quick. And, yes. you know, you can type and it's out there. And I think music also can suffer a little from that. You know, people write a song, they immediately want to record it and ship it off to somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the pro that process has changed uh, uh, dramatically in, in a lot of ways because of technology. And, um, you know, the fact that you can, you know, download so much stuff on your computer and then just kind of string it all together and create stuff um, is fine. And I have nothing against that, but it bypasses... Um, uh, again, it filters out all the learning that right. should go into getting to that point. And perhaps if you had a few more tools at your disposal in terms of what you had learned in your in your life, you might create even better and even more. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, in, in some ways it's expanded um, the way people are doing things. But in other ways, it's kind of shrunk it down, in my opinion, uh, because people are bypassing. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to practice. I don't want to waste time doing it. I don't have to do that. I can just do this, you know, and, and okay, that's great. And it's fine. And, and certainly there's a creative aspect to that, but it's not the same. It's a, you know, it's a quick it's, fix. It's uh -huh. a quick fix. It's, and it's important to reinforce that we had the opportunity to do a master class at Anderson University uh, yeah. last year in South Carolina for their music department. And uh, those kids were just oh, remarkable. It wonderful. was, we went away feeling like it had been one of the most satisfying, yes. fulfilling things we had ever done. Undoubtedly. And one of the things that we um, emphasized for these kids was make sure your toolbox has every possible tool in it. So that you have the option to, you know, build a skyscraper or a little cottage. It comes mm. down to how many tools do you have in your box. And the only yeah. way to get tools in your box is to study and to work hard and to practice, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so there has to be a work ethic in there. And I think that's one of the things that's missing today is there are too many um, ways you can just plug and play. And yay, I'm an artist. Well, yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's shallow <laughs> don't victory, think so. but they, most people don't realize it. Yeah, that's true. Suffice it to say that the industry is evolving and will continue to evolve. And Correct. there's plenty of challenges, I think, for everybody in the industry. Today. Oh, God, yes. But uh, yeah, it's and it's you know. I hope it it ends in a good spot. I hope it ends in a good spot. You know what? I have I have no doubt that it will. I, I do mean, too. you know, yeah. it may it, take a little bit. It or. may take a little bit, but you know, the one one advantage of getting a little older, shall we say, is that you've been around long enough to see things come around a couple of times. And I think yeah. That, yeah, I think we are seeing that because I yeah. run into kids that are you know still elementary age, and they have been hearing the music of their mother or father, Ed, because their grandparents played it for them. For that's, instance, that's, you know, friends of ours who are pl played the Eagles or, mm -hmm. you know, Santana or whatever at their home. And yeah. then those kids grew up listening to it. And now those people are 30-year-old parents and their kids are hearing it. So I'm starting to see that, you know, that's yeah, being passed there's along. There's a longevity in the music today yeah. that uh, may not have been for, say, Music that was in the 40s or 30s. Right. I mean, there's still some of it around. And some, oh, undoubtedly, and yeah. Appreciation. But oh, God, yeah. The 50s and 60s, 70s, like it's it has more staying power. Mm -hmm. I it's think a, you're right. Because of the media, I think. Uh, I would have to the agree, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Probably true. Okay. Well, we're going to move on to the next bit of the show, which is called Round the Table. Round the Table. Okay. Yes. So sounds like a drinking game. So what we're going to do is uh, we have a few little questions, uh, but the first one we're going to do is we are going to briefly talk about Woodstock then mm -hmm. and Woodstock now. Okay. My question uh, would be if you could have someone from the original Woodstock mm -hmm. come to this current Woodstock. Mm -hmm. Which Never is mind. Woodstock 50, right? Woodstock 50. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind that they may have passed away. Mm -hmm. let's, let's bring them all back to life. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who would you have? Jimi Hendrix. Janis Joplin. 
I, that was my second choice. Well, you only get one choice. I know. That's now, right. Santana will be there. <laughs> yes. Which is really, yes. And some of the – actually, there's a few. Uh, John Fogarty, uh, yes. Zombies. There's a few. Country Joe McDonald. Country Joe McDonald. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. There's going to be yeah. a few. David Cross. Oh, Joe yeah. Cocker. Yeah. yeah. Be, oh, God, yeah. yeah. Now, tell us, well, why do you want to see Hendricks? It, just because he was amazing, of course. Yes. Uh, it, because he was so innovative, yeah. particularly at that time, nobody, I mean, no one mm-hmm. was doing what he was doing. Mm-hmm. And I think to this day, really, mm-hmm. no one has ever quite captured, you know, the mm-hmm. what he was doing yeah. just, and just a, the way he was doing period. it. It was it what was, he was doing at the time. Yes. And uh, some people would disagree, but I believe that because he was mm-hmm. cut short, uh, yeah. leads to the legend. And he mm-hmm. forever young. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah, well, to a degree, yes, you're mm-hmm. absolutely right. And I feel the same but, way about Janis Joplin. Oh, that he, Janis. You know, mm-hmm. at that time, there really weren't any girl singers no. who were doing what not, she was doing. Oh, no. I, I'm not a huge fan, but she did really knock it out. Well, yeah. And, oh. you know, and I that's a very good point because um, – you know, people talk about, well, I don't like that. You don't have to. All you have to do is recognize how extraordinary it was. And what really always amazes me when I see footage of her is that when she's not singing, she looks like a shy little girl that's sitting in church. Yep. And the minute she starts to sing, this other persona takes mm. over. And it's it's absolutely fascinating to watch. I think... Um, she was remarkable, and today, um, and I was fortunate enough, both of us were fortunate mm-hmm. enough to work with Beth Hart, and uh, I did some back vocals, and, and Richard worked on um, uh, her record, oddly, was recorded in the same room as the Gino Vanelli. That's right, record. Studio 8 a Studio yeah. 8 a uh, She has the ability to sing that sort of Joplin-esque yeah, she way. did a she and did a show. She's yeah. one of the most remarkable um, talents oh. I've ever worked oh, with. Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah. What and just incredible vocals and the like same that. thing when she's just being Beth, just this shy, soft spoken yeah. girl, <laughs> and then she starts to sing, and it's like a fire breathing dragon is coming out. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. amazing, it's quite amazing to be yes. part of that. Yeah. So, Jan, what about you? Oh, for Woodstock, yeah. Well, Richie Havens, oh, oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. To me, to me, I and, and you know, you can look back and say, well, you know, who embodied the spirit of Woodstock, and I think a lot of people did, but I think Richie Havens. Mm-hmm. Especially just with what he brought, and you know, even in you know in his latter days, I mean, I loved his later stuff. You know, Um, so I I would definitely bring Richie back. Mm -hmm. I would be on the Hendrix band train. (laughs) Ah, but Santana would be right behind him, Mm -hmm. you know, which I. Not that I would pay for that uh, ex- exorbitant pricing for tickets. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, there is there is that. But, uh, uh, but it is hard to choose. You know, you start to think about it, and then I think of Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Mm-hmm. And, and Young actually did play a little bit he with He did, yes. yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because Joni Mitchell was supposed to be at Woodstock, that's, and she couldn't. She had a previous engagement right. she couldn't get out of. But those guys mm-hmm. did mm-hmm. their version of her song. You know, called Woodstock, and uh, it's a obviously a classic, uh, classic oh, yes. tune. It's held mm. up over the yes, years. Yes, it has. Yeah. We're going to move into more of a quick fire round Uh-oh. now. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure. What was your favorite album project you worked on, Mary? Um, that would be Beth Hart. Leave the light on. Yeah. Richard. Favorite album project or favorite tour? Well, well both. We can do both. Okay. Um, favorite album project, I think, would have been Just of the Gemini, which we were talking about earlier, uh, for a whole bunch of different reasons. And um, I think my favorite tour um, was uh, when I was with Gary Wright. We did a nine-month European tour with Peter Frampton. Gary and Peter had the same management at the time, and we had a private plane, which is a Boeing 700, the predecessor to the 707. Big four-engine uh, plane, all dressed up on the inside. And this is the first time I'd ever been in a plane like this, and so that was a treat. Plus, we got to go to places in Europe that it, I'd never dreamt that I'd get to go to. Um, and uh, it was very early in the um, arena-type 
concerts in Europe. At that time, they, they you know, it was already kind of happening in the U.S. and Canada, but in Europe, they were a little bit behind yeah. in that area. And so we were doing, we were sort of breaking new ground uh, at that time. So I would say that would be certainly one of my favorite tours. I mean, you know, they were all interesting in various different ways, but that one... Okay, so hold the phone. Okay. Because I believe... Mary may have something in her bag <laughs> in relation to that Gary Wright tour. This it's, is something everybody's got to see. It's true. This is very funny. Yeah. Gary was a very into the um, space and universal sort of thing. And so all the guys wore outfits like this on stage. Am I <laughs> holding this in the proper way? And, um, there were platform silver boots that went with it. Oh yes, and, uh, yeah. yeah. So they were all sort of looking like spacemen on the on that particular. <laughs> and they were supposed they had OM written yes. on it yes. on the yes. front, but it wasn't OM as in O H M. It was A U M. A U. Yeah. So I'm not sure whether I, yeah. the seamstress just couldn't spell. Or <laughs> <laughs> what it, what I don't it know. Again, maybe somebody watching this. International spelling. Well, maybe, yeah. 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 Who knows? Oh, that that is so much fun. Isn't that so funny? Fun. Yeah. I'm going to switch that topic around and, and ask you both. Um, similar question, slightly different, though. Mary, what album would you like to have worked on? Um, let's see. That's a very good question. I would say Heart Like a Wheel, Linda Ronstadt. Okay. Yep. yep. Lots of wonderful background vocals. Emmy Lou Harris, Dolly Parton, um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, really great singers worked, uh, did the back vocals for that uh, record. And it was, of course, her, that was her big breakout mm -hmm. record. That would have been 1974. And it was right about the time that Peter Asher became her manager. And uh, he also signed James Taylor at the same time. So he was instrumental in making that record really go. But it's uh, in reading about her, she was extremely astute as to what uh, songs should be on the record. So I think she made some really great choices. The name of the record, Heart Like a Wheel, uh, is a song that was written by one of the McGarrigal yeah. girls. And uh, it's it's a, a wonderful song. But yeah, that would be that would be my choice. Richard, what album? Uh, there are probably quite a few. Uh, I would say one is, that, and I can't remember the name of the album, perhaps somebody could help me here, but it was Steely Dan's first record. Mm. And I was a big fan of the band. Yeah. Um, I was thinking a little while ago, I wonder if you've <clears throat> ever worked with anybody. From oh, Steve. you know, actually, um, I was in a recording studio in L.A. one day and I got to meet them, which was thrilling for me because I was a huge fan. And we were working in the room next door. They were in, a, in another studio and we kind of met in the mm. in the hallway. Um, but I, I, had, I had heard an interview and I don't remember who it was on the radio said it's like every... Mm -hmm session musicians dream oh, to work with yeah. Steely Dan. Oh, yeah. No, they were... Um, so they, innovative. Yeah. yeah, they were very, very innovative. The There were elements of rock, of jazz, of, you know, it was a fusion of so many different things and the way they approach things and the meticulousness. These guys were known for being, you know... Uh, not always in a good way, but just being, mm -hmm. it's got to be my way or the highway, mm -hmm. right? But they, you know, they stuck to their guns and, and their mm -hmm. work. By their music. So yeah, I was sure you were going to say uh, Return to Forever. Oh, very cool. Band. Well, yeah. Chick Corea. Yeah. Really, uh, you know. yeah. No, you're right. That would definitely be another one. I mean, you know, Chick is Chick. Uh, one of my all-time idols is Chick Corea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a, as a piano player. Right. Uh, Chick Corea and Oscar Peterson, for me, are the two of the greatest... Um, uh, players ever, in my opinion, and uh, Arthur Rubinstein from a classical standpoint, only because he was probably the preeminent interpreter of Chopin at the time, and I was a big fan of Chopin, and still am to this day. I just gravitated toward uh, toward that music and played a lot of those pieces, and uh, Arthur was just astounding. I mean, the yeah. guy was just an amazing player. Okay, one last question. Okay. okay. <laughs> Beatles or Stones? Uh, oh, that's so unfair. Oh, that's really unfair. That's really oh, unfair man. because to me, that's like saying apples or oranges. Yes, it is. Well, if you had to, oh, I'd have to pick the Beatles. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now Jan's going to split the hair and say, early Beatles, late Beatles, or mid Beatles. Oh. Ooh. Um. 
I think I'd have to say mid Beatles. Pretty sure. I think I would agree. Mid, would you go mid, Beatles too? Or? Mid to late. Um, Stones or Beatles is the question. I would have to go with the Beatles only because um, the number of songs that they wrote and they were uh, preeminent songsters. The Stones, uh, in my opinion, great band, mm-hmm. wonderful performers, and where they shine in, in my mind. I mean, you know, outside of all the hits that we all heard on the radio, which is absolutely wonderful, but for me, uh, their performance element, especially Mick, mm-hmm. of course, is just yeah. off yeah. the charts. Yeah, that's the ones are it's, much, it's, it's more it's, straight up rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah they, they are. Exactly. And they did, don't get me wrong, they did write some yeah. really great oh, tunes, but when you look at the Beatles catalog, it's just it's amazing. It's, it's insane. Yeah. And I mean, it's um, so much yeah. melody, I mean, like, yeah. you know, and so, well, you know, yeah. especially from uh, the, the perspective as a vocalist, for me, you know, the melodies are so memorable. You know? uh, they are. So, they yeah. Are. But mid, yeah, the mid mid Beatles. I think I have to say, I would I would agree. Probably right. Yeah. Mid to late, there was some really mm. late yeah. stuff. That's too, kind of usually piece. where we end up. Yeah. And talking of ending up, I think we do need to to bring oh, really? this wonderful <laughs> conversation to a close. We may end up doing it again. Who knows? We would love to. Thank That's, you for having us. Yes, thank you so much for having us. That's it for this edition of the business business of music. You can find me online at folkrootsradio.com. And me, uh, quantumsoundproductions.ca. One last question. If there was one piece of advice you would give to someone starting out in music, Mm -hmm. what would it be? Wow. (laughs) Go to law school. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The thought crossed my mind. but. you're talking about someone that has career aspirations or yeah, just what it, yeah somebody all right if you have career aspirations as we mentioned earlier my advice would be study 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 practice 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 and get really really good at what you do mm-hmm. because once you have those tools and you have that behind you you can go anywhere mm-hmm. there's nothing stopping you from going here or here or here whereas if you narrow yourself down too early to one genre that's you're pretty much stuck. In, well, not you know. necessarily genre. I think just having the tools, like you say, yeah. being yes. capable of doing whether it's writing, performing, producing, uh, being really good at your craft, work hard, practice. That's what they say. What? How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. practice, that's, practice. Just, that's, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's pretty much it. Um, so remember, subscribe, ring the bell. Leave your comments, and the podcast is available wherever you want to download podcasts. So that's pretty much it for today. And we'll see you next time. It's been great. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.